Especially of an animal in a wild state after escape from captivity or domestication. Alcatraz, Arab Spring, one billion rising. Freedom schools, the Maroons, rebellion thriving. We've been rising since the dawn of creation. Sun in the blood of our veins, liberation runs from Muhammad. Welcome to Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I'm your host, Anjali Nathupathia. We begin with a content note or trigger warning. Here at Feral Visions, we go deep, and that often means courageously addressing white supremacist, imperialist, heteropatriarchal, capitalist, settler, colonial violence in order to support healing and transformation. Bypassing isn't an option. The only way is through. The time for denial is over, and today's a great day to keep it real. Amidst the show's focus on unapologetic truth-telling, then, please, practice excellent self and community care while listening. Where we can all attain emancipation from oppression, break the chains from Haiti to Tibet and worldwide. Don't forget the resistance in our roots and resilience in our breath. In the blood of our veins, liberation runs. We are standing on the shoulders of the ancient ones. Do you wonder what on earth it means to decolonize taste buds? And what does taste memory or womb ecology have to do with our collective liberation? Are you curious about indigenous veganism or ancestral food ways? If so, today's episode of Feral Visions is for you. I'm delighted to be in dialogue with my colleague Claudia Serrato, who's joining us from Baja, Mexico. We met back in 2014 when we co-organized a panel on food sovereignty and plant-based diets in San Juan, Puerto Rico, at the annual meeting of the National Women's Studies Association. For nearly two decades, this Purepecha Huasteca Chicanic scholar has dedicated herself to the study of food, the body, healing, and decolonization. In 1998, questioning ethnic, cultural, and racialized determinants of health that placed her at risk for food-related diseases, Claudia took preventative health measures by returning to her ancestral foodways, a native and plant-based diet, an indigenous veganism. Eating earth-based fed her creative passion to produce critical Chicanx short reflexive writings on decolonizing the diet and the coloniality of food first featured in 2008 on the blog Decolonial Food for Thought. In 2011, while expecting, Claudia indigenized her prenatal nutrition and seasoned her amniotic fluid with ancestral flavors towards decolonizing her baby's taste buds. This womb ecology informs Serrato's truth-telling, seasoned with critical, decolonial, Chicana feminist spices and flavors that have been tasted, heard, smelled, touched and or seen in and out of institutions, community, home, and kitchen spaces. In La Cocina since the age of five, Chef Claudia cooks up plant, raw, vegan, and indigenous-based foods at native food summits and gatherings throughout Turtle Island, alongside indigenous grassroots to high-profile chefs. She also caters community events and hosts pop-up dinners for Cocina Mana Corjini, a business she co-founded. In the community, Serrato teaches cooking classes, facilitates food demonstrations and workshops, and provides professional consultation services to individuals and organizations. Serrato is also the co-founder of Across Our Kitchen Tables, a woman of color culinary resource and network hub. As a multi-issue social justice public activist scholar, Claudia speaks at university campuses, in classrooms, cultural gatherings, and radio programming on decolonization, indigenous veganism, womb ecology, and native women in the kitchen. She can be heard on Feminist Magazine, Animal Voices, Toasted Sister, and Native America Calling. In the Academy, Claudia is a PhD candidate of anthropology from the University of Washington and holds two lecturer positions at Cal Poly Pomona for the Department of Ethnic and Women's Studies and Regenerative Studies. 
She holds two master's degrees in anthropology and Mexican-American studies and a BA in gender, ethnicity, and multicultural studies. In her time in Betwixt and Between, Claudia enjoys writing and cooking flavors of decolonial love, all while learning about local, regional, wild plant foods, seed saving, growing food, and nurturing her children by continuing to decolonize their palates. Claudia, thank you for your time today. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great to reconnect with you. And I'm so excited uh, for you to be able to share some of your work with listeners. I really admire the work that you're doing. So thank you for that and stoked to be in dialogue. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's such a great honor. Mm -hmm, for sure. Thank you for that. So to begin to get going, I know that your work involves this idea of decolonizing diets. And I would love for our listeners to be able to hear from you how you understand that idea. What does it mean for someone to be decolonizing their diet? You know, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, when we think about decolonization, we think about uh, the colonial project, we think about colonialism, right? So in order for us to even begin to address what it means to decolonize, we have to understand what is it that's colonized. And so in thinking about our diet, there is a lot to think about because, you know, diets have changed throughout time and space. And um, when I started coming at this work, you know, and coming to my own awareness and my own consciousness of what it, what it means to decolonize anything, I was really focused on my ancestral food ways. So I took the time to, to study colonial foods. How is it that there is a relation between, you know, decolonizing, you know, a diet and how does that, what does that mean for me specifically coming from families that live in Michoacan or families that come from different parts of Mexico and our diets being predominantly plant-based. So for me in understanding what it means to decolonize a diet or the diet starts with thinking about the foods that weren't original foods that were part of our, you know, cultural heritage ancestry. And so that is how I entered the world of, you know, even starting that, that initiative for myself and decolonizing my diet. But it could also mean different things for different people, depending where they're located at again, and also to their, their migration story and where they reside now throughout Turtle Island. And, you know, whether it's there or Mexico or Central America, South America or wherever, you know, within the global indigenous, right? You know, so it could also mean getting away from processed foods. It could also mean not eating a heavy breakfast in the morning, right? It could mean replacing alternative meats. So, for example, taking chicken, beef, and pork out and, and bringing back ancestral foods like bison, like rabbit, like deer. For some folks, it could mean going completely plant-based because understanding that their um, ethnic heritage is predominantly plant-based. So, for some folks, they, they might want to call that veganism, but again, that that's that's something you got to be really careful with because it's it's such a loaded word because it can mean a lot of things. So I don't necessarily say that, oh, to decolonize a diet means to go vegan uh, because there has to be a critical consciousness and awareness of, you know, what the colonial matrix of power and how that plays out in food systems and within, you know, the 500 past years of colonization. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, so that. It, it, so it depends. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and for example, here in a place like Hawaii, of course, food sovereignty would involve fish, for instance. And so taking seriously, of course, um, the dialogue being very place-based, super contextual, like you're saying, it depends on so much. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very place-based. And But even with that, though, it, it's really interesting because in the work that, that I've done and in talking with community members and, and even some of my own colleagues and friends, we, we also understand that place-based knowledge is also mobile knowledge, right? So it's something that moves with us. Mm -hmm. So if we are from one particular area and for whatever reasons we need to move from that area, we embody this knowledge and, and this taste palette, this taste bud, and we move with it and we bring it with us. So it, it moves and it transplants depending on where we're at regionally and it's adaptive, mm -hmm. right? So we also have these adaptive diets. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that yeah. element in. And I love that you take seriously taste buds in your work. And so can you elaborate on that piece a little bit? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so it, it, it started off as a personal 
journey for myself and really thinking about, you know, what does it mean to decolonize your taste buds, right? So again, this goes back to decolonizing your diet because there's levels within that, right? There's the mind, there's the spirit, there's the body, but now, okay, let's talk about the body. So for me, you know, I went on a quest of wanting to learn about how memory gets recorded in the body. So automatically, you know, I, I started to pay attention to the works coming out of gut feminism and, you know, and the anthropology of the body. I began to understand the, the important role of biology because, again, my journey was to understand how taste memory develops and how that happens from all kinds of different perspectives, you know, social, anthropological, you know, even cultural. But then there came this biological factor. And so I began to understand how one eats, one chews, how flavor, you know, moves around in the mouth, how it becomes part of that, that nerve sensation. And, you know, eventually what that whole process is when it, when it breaks down, you know, down to a molecular level. And for me, understanding that also to works that come out of like womb ecology, for example, how what one is exposed to from the time of birth you know, from through taste is what one will ultimately crave in their life journey. And so for me, that became really, really important because I began to think about my family, my family's house, my own house, the foods that I was eating and what the foods that I was craving. And for me, I understood colonization as like, you know, not just colonizing my diet, but colonizing my mouth and colonizing my taste buds. And so what I came to understand was that that in order to really decolonize, I really had to address what it was that was being put in my mouth and what flavors it was that I was craving. So that is is sort of what, what led me into wanting to take it to the next level, which was understanding how taste develops while in first life, which would be the womb. And, uh, and in that work that I began doing, I, I discovered or, and self-discovered, I want to say, mm-hmm. is that taste development or the taste first begins in the womb. And, and, I, and I questioned that mm. in my work. Well, how does that happen? How, mm. how, what is that process like? And sure enough, you know, there's, there's work already that's coming out on this with uh, perinatal care. And, and that is that the amniotic fluid takes on the flavors of what one is consuming, what one is eating through the pores, and that first life begins to swallow this particular fluid. And so it was my ultimate goal then to basically indigenize my amniotic fluid. I wanted to create flavors that my my second child was going to be exposed to when I was pregnant. Um, And this was back in 2011 because of that specific reason that I did not want her to be exposed to her, her first flavors to be colonial flavors. I wanted her to understand and know her ancestral palate. So I, that's what I did. I indigenized my prenatal nutrition, my diet. I ate foods that were uh, regional to the place that I was at that spoke to my ancestry. And then food that I was told I wasn't supposed to eat, like chili, for example. I loaded up on that because I wanted to make sure that my amniotic fluid was going to be hot and spicy. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Thank was, you. So I wanted my child to eat spicy food. I, mm-hmm. I wanted my child to, to crave these foods because, you know, it, again, it was all very theoretical. And it wasn't until I conceived my child and began to feed her first foods when it was time for her to eat first foods that I began to say, wait a minute, like this, this whole work that is coming out, it, it, it's real. Because I began to notice the foods that she was craving, the foods that she was asking for. And these were foods that she was being exposed to from the time of really conception till, till now. She's six years old. So my strong focus in my work is, re- is not so much decolonizing diet, but really decolonizing the taste bud. And that means changing up our foods, right? Less salt, less sugar, seasoning our foods very differently, using cedar instead of, um, you know, garlic salt, for example, right? Like what are foods that we can change up because it ultimately comes down to what we crave and what we taste because that's the foods that we're going to pursue, so it, it, it became sort of a personal journey when I began to study, you know, the, the importance of the aspects of the tongue. But it was the work that I was doing prior to that led me to wanting to unpack that a little bit more. So now, you know, with with, with thinking about the tongue and decolonizing taste buds, I'm also thinking about it um, in terms of the, the senses and, and, and sensory processes, which is, you know, another another aspect of decolonizing the diet. Right, absolutely, which is so very important, especially for some of our family members and in some of our communities where 
this is not a conversation that's happening right now in mass at all. There's not the sort of critical consciousness around this and is a deadly consequence to that, right? To make it plain. It is. So can you talk about some of the importance or the significance of this work just to make crystal sure. clear for some of our listeners that might be thinking about some of these things for the very first time through hearing this dialogue? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, you know, the first thing that came to mind when I heard you saying, asking this question, I was at a conference once and a presenter was talking about food sovereignty and how important it is for children to as little as two years old, I think the conversation was to get exposed to native foods. And, you know, how important, you know, food sovereignty is just as much as important food security is. Mm -hmm. And this was around, you know, indigenous foods and indigenous um, projects that are coming out of the indigenous food movement. And I was taken back because, you know, I asked, you know, what were people's thoughts about food sovereignty as being something that begins in, in, in the first environment, mm -hmm. which is the womb. Mm -hmm. And presenters shared that there was no conversation around that that folks were addressing food sovereignty as something you introduce to children once they get to, you know, once they're toddlers or once they're walking around or running around. And I, I was taken back because I was like, well, wait a minute. If we really want to address these health issues that are occurring everywhere, particularly in indigenous and low income communities where health disparities are, are you know, off the chart, if we really want to address, you know, child obesity and, and child food related diseases, because there's a lot of children now that are suffering from many of these, I want to say colonial in injustices mm -hmm. as a result of diet. And, and also to understanding, for example, like um, the reservation food system and you had a lot of um, government food commodities. And a lot of these food commodities, when you expose these particular foods to children, these are foods they're going to crave. They're going to grow up eating this food. They're going to grow up wanting these foods that are not particularly the healthiest foods. And again, you know, the, the, there's other issues that, that I'm not speaking to that, that speak to food access or even having land to even grow food, right? There, there's these other determinants. But nonetheless, in really thinking about, for me, for example, and for other families, and I hope that this is a conversation that will take place and begin to happen in uh, more reproductive circles, that we really need to begin to really address food sovereignty from, from the place of the womb, from first life, you know, to really want to work with these foods that are ancestral or place-based and so forth. We need to we need to have a craving for them. We need to taste them. And if our first exposure to these tastes occurs in the womb, then we need to be like rethinking our prenatal nutrition. We need to be re rethinking what, what the, these particular elements are that are gonna nourish this new life, the next seven generations. Because this is what's gonna run through their blood. This is what's gonna run and, and help develop them as conscious, you know, spirit beings. And I feel more too, you know, there's, there's this conversation about, oh, we need children to eat more veggies. We need them to eat more fruits and so forth. And again, if it's not something that's been developed in their mouth and their saliva whole memory, I don't know if that's even a word, right? Saliva mm -hmm. and, and their memory process that occur in their mouth. My mouth is already just salivating thinking about food, right? They're, they're not going to want it. And so we need to create that. And, you know, what I have seen even in my own daughter is that, you know, there's foods that, she's, that she craves that I don't crave because I didn't grow up eating those foods, but she did. So now she becomes not just my teacher, but also my healer, right? So it's something that it's intergenerational because if we begin to really address this from that time, then we are going to be able, you know, we really do become, you know, that those that we've been praying for. Traditional ecological knowledge is passed down to the next generation. Yes, it's oral, but it's something you get to taste. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different type of storytelling. It's a different type of way of, of holding on to and passing down tradition and knowledge that can be tasted, that can be embodied, and that and that really evokes and activates a type of memory that is ultimately, you know, a taste bud. Mm -hmm. It recites in that little, you know, cellular, molecular level, right, this taste. And to be able to taste food sovereignty and to be able to you know, have a taste of decolonization to know what that can taste like. I think it's it's beyond vital to the whole decolonial project in and of itself, but also to in the health and restoration of, of ecological systems that involve the human body, that involves the next seven generations. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you so much for bringing all of that up. It is so very rich on so many different fronts. Um, so invoking multiple oral traditions simultaneously, right? The orality of eating and then also the storytelling that gets passed yes. down, whether it's right in recipes as knowledge production or otherwise ways of yes. relating with our environment, with non-human animals, plants, other life, the elements. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's so much to um, elaborate on here. So thank you for bringing up all those elements. They're so important. So bringing in right traditional ecological knowledge, so to speak, and the political aspect of this work, because again, you know, a lot of our community members that are having conversations around decolonization and taking it very seriously, aren't necessarily talking about even food so much, definitely not talking yeah. about taste buds and taste memory. So <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the political dimension of this project? Sure, sure. I was thinking a lot about that. And I think one, the decision alone to want to take on or learn about or explore even the idea or the concept of how one can begin to decolonize a diet is a political move, mm -hmm. you know? So I wanna start with with that being, you know, the person, cause again, the person always political, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like within this larger, you know, global <laughs> global world system, you know, also to being trained in, in medical anthropology, like I understand political economies and I understand, you know, the medical anthropology of, of health and food systems, right? You know, to really tackle this on from the home space or at least starting from the home space, there is like a like a butterfly effect, right? You begin to really tackle on these other larger forces. For example, the supermarkets. For example, chain chain products, which also you know speak to these uh, larger you know food plantations or you know farms, right? That go further out, and and you know and the influences and how those decision makers are coming about and and making these types of decisions of who has what food what food is going where, the cost of food, and then how the food is going to be marketed. When, once you begin to reconnect with, with what decoloniality means for someone, you know, it, it really then begins to not just disrupt these, this political food chain, but it also then begins to, I want to say, begin to heal ecological and sacred geographies and or landscapes, because then you bring about in the restoration of, of certain ecosystems, right? Depending on what it is that you're eating. If you begin to, you know, decide to go more place-based, then not only are you contributing to the local ecology, but you're also working on uh, community economic development, right? So you're bringing back, you know, money into, into the community. Also too, depending on where you eat, right? There is a lot of particularly women of color that I know personally know that are doing pop-up um, food gigs that are really addressing plant-based and, and vegan foods and indigenous foods. And, and if we begin to support these particular um, ground-up establishments versus those that are top-down, then we bring back the money into our community, right? So again, it's very economic um, when we want to think about it within uh, that particular, you know, political realm. But again, right, we, we're also bringing in issues of the environment. We're bringing in issues of, you know, the oceans, right? It's really working towards establishing a little bit more balance. So, you know, again, there, there, there is so many ROMs in how this particular de decolonizing project can grow and, and, and manifest itself. And, you know, and, and I have a, in, in, my, in my participation and what I have seen, I kind of see it all happening at the same time. So there's just like this multiple matrix dimensions that all occur at, at the same time, you know, but they all are at their own different pace. But I personally feel that it, it really comes down to what you bring home, what you bring into your refrigerator, what you bring into your home space. And again, this speaks to, you know, colonialism and how our refrigerators are colonized. You know, how do we, let's start there, right? Before we're going to decolonize our palace, before we're going to decolonize our tongue, why don't we begin to decolonize our refrigerators? Mm -hmm. um, you know, take out the foods that shouldn't be in there. Perhaps maybe even reclaim our refrigerators. I know I have, I don't use the shelves that are designed to maintain my body and to, perform, you know, perform this, uh, uh, you know, the performance of the body eating, right? Like I don't participate in that particular style that has been set up for me. And, you know, so it, it, it goes to even to, to that level, right? Is it, how we reclaim that space. So, you know, and thinking about, about the politics, I, I just think about, 
it as I don't know if there's a word for it now or, or yet, but it, it's, it has to do with it's beyond decoloniality because it, it's an action. It's no longer a theory, you know, and I guess it speaks to Chicana feminisms, right? Because we talk a lot about, you know, theory in the flesh. But I feel that it, it's something a little bit more deeper, but it's definitely within that within that that political dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's evocative of resurgence for me. Even just the sort of double entendre of a taste bud, a bud like a flower blossoming or resurging, right? It's almost like this blossoming resurgence. So it's always yes. already praxis or in action, exactly. like you said, not just somehow abstractly divorced from the flesh, taking it back to Anzaldúa or Moraga or so many other, yes. right? Four yes. founders of so many of the movements, right, that we've inherited. Um, that remind us, right, that again, also that memory is always already embodied, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about, so your personal uh, experience with these topics we've been getting into. So you took it back several years um, to your last pregnancy. And prior to that, so what really inspired you to begin with um, to be actually in your own life trying out these different forms of relating to plants and animals around you? Um, so also honoring the kind of right intersubjectivity that we're getting into here. Um, yeah. Because I know so many of us have stories, a lot of stories around how we've entered into this work, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, you know, this started many, many years ago. Um, I was in my early 20s. And I had, um, I was invited to move to Northern California, um, and I did. I, I was like, you know, let me get out of LA. I'm a city girl. I need to know what's out there. And um, being out there, I was, I was invited to, um, I was invited out to the land, um, as the way it was put to me. And you know, I accepted. Um, we were going to live in the bush for a few days with with a family, and being there. Um, you know, there was a teepee and there was this, this cabin and but there was no refrigeration. There was no electricity. There was any any of that going on. And um, I was wondering, like, what are we going to eat? How are we going to cook? Where is our food going to come from? And, you know, I, I at the time was like the joke because people looked at me like, oh, this poor girl. She just didn't know. <laughs> and I did, I didn't know. And they were like, oh, it's time to eat. And I was like, OK, so what are we going to do? And they're like, we need to go forage. Um, and that's what we did. We foraged along um, the river and we foraged along the land. And they were telling me what to pick and what to bring. And we brought this food together. And, you know, there, something happened to me right there and then. And I felt, you know, a disconnection, but a connection where I was like, wait, this is too familiar to me. I've never done this before, but why does this feel familiar? And at the same time, um, my family was having a hardship. My grandfather was really sick and he had a heart attack. And so, you know, I was processing what I was experiencing, you know, being touching the land and, and eating directly from the land in the ways that I was. Um, and then I also began to think about what, you know, the larger establishments had to say about me and my family was that we were all prone to food related diseases, particularly diabetes, um, high cholesterol and other heart um, diseases and also to cancer. And I thought, well, there, there's a disconnection between what I'm experiencing here with the land and with what I'm eating and with what I'm being told, because if I'm eating, if I'm naturally or, you know, within my culture, I'm supposed to be eating this particular way because I do come from, um, you know, a plant plant based family. Then why why am I being told I'm going to die if this is, you know, abundant in, in nourishment and nutrition? And um, so I began to do that research is I wanted to understand, well, what is what I think to be Mexican, quote unquote, food, because I am, you know, Purepecha Huasteca Chicana. So culturally identify as Mexican. And, um, and what I realized is that the foods that I really truly believed were situated within my cultural family and heritage were indeed um, very colonial influenced. And so I began to explore that. Well, okay, well, what of these foods is, is non-native? And, um, and then in that journey, then you, you know, you study, well, how is it that, for example, you know, pigs, sheep, and pork became, uh, I'm sorry, uh, beef became very popular. How did that right. become part of, 
you know, the Mexican um, cuisine mm -hmm. or more so the Mesoamerican cuisine right. um, because that is, you know, was not part of the diet. And uh, so then, you know, I learned and studied about, um, you know, co a colonial idea, colonial food ideologies that had to do with race and this fear of becoming inferior if one was exposed or ate indigenous foods and why it is that, you know, a, 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 a sort of mestizaje occurred within food. Um, in order to continue to perpetuate these uh, these racial hierarchies of, of people, but again through the the ideology of food, and a lot of this comes from Re uh, Rebecca Earle's work, um, and um, you know, so I myself, uh, you know, began to really process that, and I said, well, I'm gonna it's I'm gonna I'm gonna start to decolonize my own diet, and because I really it was a matter of survival for me. It, w it became a survival tactic. Right. I was like, well, I'm going to get rid of these foods because if I'm being told I'm going to die and I'm prone to having these particular diseases, then I'm going to get rid of these particular foods that um, have become destructive to me and my family, which, which again, is, it really speaks to, um, you know, the, the establishment of carnicerias, panaderias, and lecherias, right? So, um, and then when I began to take out these foods, my food began to look very similar. It was, you know... Uh, corn, beans, and squash, and just very Mexican, you know, indigenous foods. But then when I re-looked at my food, I was like, this is vegan. Yeah. I was like, wait, yeah. hold on a second here. And and so then um, at that time, too, I was really studying and really getting into um, Chicana feminist work a, a little bit more than what I did when I was, you know, um, getting my bachelor's degree. This was already during my master's program. And I remember reading, um, you know, a passage from uh, Sherry Moraga in Queer Aslan, where she talks about how Aslan is no longer a mythological homeland, but is indeed flesh, skin, and bones, which is under colonial, patriarchal, white supremacist, imperialist occupation. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately, I made that connection between my body as a landscape and as a land and it being occupied. And I thought, well, well, wait a minute. How is my body occupied? How is my body now a colonial zone? Mm. And I thought, well, how can I, what, what can I do about this? Mm. And I thought, well, decolonize. And that, it just like came to me. And I was like, mm. okay, well, how, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. And then it was just like in a moment. So not only was I taking these particular foods out, but now I knew that part of my decolonizing practice was, was not just re-indigenizing my food, but it was also liberating my, my internal body from colonial infestation. Mm -hmm. That is what got me to really rethink um, veganism from an indigenous perspective because, you know, yeah, I, I was not okay with these environmental destructions that were occurring. Yes, I, I do not support any type of violence against any human or non-human species, but what really began to upset me is the displacement of the wild relatives on these particular landscapes that these large factory farms were being built on. Mm -hmm. And I began to think about, well, what about the bear? And what yeah. about the coyote? Yeah. And what about the salmon? And what yeah. about the gopher? Yeah. And then, yeah, so then my vegan, my vegan, indigenous veganist practice then began to really address relationality mm -hmm. and the relationships that I have with these other non-human um, life forms that were also being, you know, affected and displaced as a result of this particular colonial dominating way of eating. So that is what ignited that that flame to to really address um, and challenge these, um, you know, vegan principles that are that are, you know, within a popular culture is really centered on um, this white Eurocentric ideology of what it means to be vegan and so I you know I became an advocate for brown folks mm -hmm. and how it's our veganism looks like and what mm -hmm. that can play out um, within mm -hmm. different social cultural spaces and also to helping folks remember for those people that particularly come and have Mesoamerican and other Southwest indigenous ancestry is that we are plant-based peoples and what did that look like seasonally and what did that look like you know in migration and what did that look like through trade? So all of this is what led me to finally, you know, arrive to the place of, well, not only have I indigenized slash decolonized my diet, you know, in the ways that I know how, in the ways that I am capable of, but now I'm pregnant. So now I need to indigenize my pregnancy, right? So this is kind of like what led up to, to that ultimate moment 
of understanding that there is another dimension of environment that I also need to be concerned about and that other folks should be concerned about too, which again is the, it's the womb, the first home, right? It, it's its own ecosystem. And it's like, well, what are we doing to repair that? Because if we really want to address or think about, you know, the next seven generations to come, and it, it has to start there, right? At least from the way I understand it, from the way I have lived my life and the way now that I see myself, you know, bringing together all the worlds that, that I that I reside in, right? Because it's, it's, it's so many, you know, as an anthropologist, as a lecturer, as a PhD candidate, and as a chef, because I, I do cook. I also run, a, a, you know, a, a, an indigenous catering business. But also to, I want to say, you know, uh, I, I don't even have a term for it yet, but, you know, like, like a doula indigenous advocate, right, in really helping us rethink reproduction from the perspective of, of food and the next seven generations to come, right? Because this is, this is our time. This is a decolonizing era, at least for, you know, within our, you know, region of the world. If food is a, is a tool, then it's utilize that tool and let food be our tool towards liberation. Mm-hmm. You can say that again. It's just so very important, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, and why wouldn't we? It's just so much more delicious. Let's be real, right? Why, exactly. <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> you know, folks so, love, yeah, yeah, talking about, you know, Tony K. Bambara's notion of the role of any artist being making the revolution irresistible. And I'm always talking with my students about the idea of riffing off of that, making decolonization delicious. Um, yes. Because when it's more delicious, when you feel better afterwards, then that's going to be the direction that people want to go in. So you don't have to exactly. get into some kind of ideological battle or debate or yes. something like that. Um, and let's be yes. real, right, in terms of the recipes and the knowledge that has been passed down, just how delicious it is and how good it feels, right, to be sharing in this way that is life affirming as opposed to disease yes. creating, right? Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Oh, why not? You know, if you can taste it. Let's let's do it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. OK, so will you tell us a little bit about the work that you do as a chef uh, and your pop up kitchen? Yes. Yes. So I've been cooking since the age of five and I never saw myself as a chef of anything. I just cooked. I just new food. I, I knew flavors. I experimented with flavors. I've, you know, growing up, I've always taken my time putting food together. When I got into indigenous veganism, I had to reclaim a lot of my family dishes and I had to make it in such a way that they would try it. Yeah. You know, cause if you say, Oh, it's vegan, they're going to, they're going to not affiliate it with being, mm-hmm. you know, culturally relevant. Mm-hmm. And so I began to say, okay, Claudia, you know food, like let's make it taste good. Let's make it taste exactly what they're used to, but let's not put in, you know, some of these other animal and their byproducts in these particular foods because this is what's getting my family sick. I began to do that and I was getting a lot of compliments, which, you know, was, I want to say a, a boost lifter because at the time I began writing for a blog called Decolonial Food for Thoughts. And out of that came the push to, well, let's materialize this knowledge. Well, how do we do that? Well, through food. In 2011, we had a project called uh, Cocina Popular de Aslan. And through that, I used to cater, I want to say, mostly Mexican. And we still used other ingredients, like, you know, like onion and garlic that were not native, but yet were plant-based and fulfilled that, that, that sazon a la mexicana. And uh, so out of that work, other opportunities came up for um, catering, feedback, and I want to say more cravings. People began to crave the food. And uh, slowly but surely, I began to offer it public. And in offering this food public, then you begin, you get known and you get known publicly. And I also had, I was very active on social media. So I was able to connect with other native chefs throughout the country. And through that, we began to have heavy dialogues and beha- began to have inter intercambios, right? So these inter exchanges, you know, recipes and knowledge sharing and really working on decolonizing culinary themes. And as a result of that, new relationships became established. I began to work directly with some of the some high visible indigenous chefs throughout Turtle Island. What happened is 
we began to validate each other. So some of us were trained in the professional kitchen and some of us were trained in our grandmother's kitchens. What was beautiful, you know, out of these conversations was that knowledge wasn't placed in a hierarchy or what it is that we came with wasn't like, well, I got trained by chef so-and-so under this French model and I've been in the kitchen for four years versus some of the, some of the women chefs, for example, and some of the men chefs as well who been in the kitchen since they were youth, right? So then I was given an honorary title as chef for my work in particularly the East LA Boy Heights community. And so I accepted that 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 honor and with that and around that same time my colleague uh, Marlena Aguilar and I decided that we were going to begin to explore more of a pura pecha cuisine and pura pecha flavors because we were so disconnected from it being born and raised in East LA so we decided to collaborate and join forces in starting up a I want to say a catering food business slash consultation services through a project called Cocina Manacurini which is kitchen and food in movement and through this particular project, we've been cooking alongside other chefs throughout, again, the country at Indigenous Food Summits, food gatherings, offering our recipes in, in our sazon. And we've also begun catering throughout LA. Our recipes feature native-based ingredients. So we also uh, do pop-up dinners. So we offer private dinners you know, out of um, our home space or other intimate spaces where we invite community folks to come down um, and we prepare uh, four, four to seven course meals that are all native-based. So we, we bring back or help folks remember some of these foods that perhaps they grew up with. And or perhaps, you know, it speaks to their region, region of, of birth, but there's been this disconnect. So we sort of see ourselves as like bridge makers, right, where we reintroduce um, these relations. And aside from that, through Cocina Manacurini, I myself with the two other compañeras have started a women of color network and resource hub to help increase visibility within inner city L.A., and um, in really creating space to teach how to start um, a food-based business from below the grassroots into whatever type of food sector they would like to enter, whether it's cottage food, whether it's pop-up, whether it's private chefing. And this particular project is called uh, Across Our Kitchen Tables. And again, the, you know, these really carry a thick decolonizing themes towards you know, our, our liberation. Mm -hmm. So stoked to hear about that work and thank you for doing it. It's so important. And again, it's astounding to me that, of course, you know, we could talk about appropriation and theft. That would be right another term for colonialism in so yeah. many spaces. But when it comes to food, it's so personal when we're talking about, again, our grandmother's recipes, especially yes. for so many of our families and cultures where so often it is the women that are passing down knowledge that then gets taken by, whether it's right, these celebrity chefs that are overwhelmingly men, or we see, you know, in so many different, especially say in California, yes. major cities, yes. right? White folks coming through and taking other people's knowledge. This would be considered plagiarism academically, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but then it's just creative play if you're taking, right, again, our grandmother's recipes. And so restoring, right, that attention and reverence um, to the peoples that have the responsibility to be stewarding this knowledge and medicine and nourishment yes. well to begin with, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, thank oh, you yeah. so much for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I would be curious to know, um, in doing all of this work that you have been, what are some of the ways that you deal with challenges that might come up um, with folks that, you know, maybe have been addicted to salt or sugar or fat, right, or maybe totally new to, for example, with some of the instances that you gave, realizing, oh, wait a minute, you mean Mexican food isn't, right, beef isn't, right, chicken, what are you talking about? Like, it's not covered in cheese? Like, what do you, uh, because it's so <laughs> intimate, right? These conversations are so personal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we have these memories that are associated with certain kinds of food. And so how do you deal with that, especially for folks that might be somewhat new to these conversations? Yeah. So, you know, it's it's really interesting because I guess it all is very situational. You know, I might be teaching in a classroom, you know, about ethnic studies and, and I make it a point to talk about food. And so these students will, will really approach me like 
they had no clue, right? Uh, but at the same time, they see it as as a moment of empowerment because then they feel like, well, wait a minute. So we're really talking about, you know, my cultural ethnic identity and how and that there's a way to reconnect with who I am because I'm completely lost. I, I don't know who I am. But wait a minute. But if you're saying that if I if I eat more of these foods, there's a chance that I'm going to begin to remember. And I'll say, you know what, as simple as that, yes. It's possible. It opens up a conversation about the tortilla. And we get to talk about and use the tortilla as a symbol of resistance. And so then, uh, you know, I'll bring in tortillas into the classroom and we'll talk about its shape. We'll talk about the cosmos. And Mm -hmm. I have my students, you know, at the end of the class, they write down the critical reflection of the day on the tortillas and how that tortilla represents them. And through dialogue and conversation, you know, by the time we're we're done exploring this and, and that particular connection, it's never a surprise anymore because folks walk away with this stronger sense of the self versus at home, you know, where I might have this particular conversation with, you know, like I did in the past, my dad. And it was very troublesome because he's like, well, then what am I supposed to eat? Or how, how, you know, how does that challenge me as a man? Right. Because there's also these, also these other internal symbolic references to a particular way of eating that has to do, you know, with, with one's gender roles and, and, you know, constructions. So you're also working through, you know, for, for, for some people that you're having these conversations with, uh, their issues of masculinity, you know, and how do you work through that? And how do you, you know, see gender and, and why, how does that play out in what you're eating? And, you know, do you feel that you're more feminine if you don't eat this? And do you feel you're losing out on masculinity here? So again, it, it really challenges one's perception of the South because that is what happened with, with my dad. You know, it took about 10 years till I finally got him to to see the light and no longer see food as, as a disrespect to him. Where if I was serving him, say, mole without chicken, but instead with papa, it wasn't me saying you're no longer a man, okay. right? And so so that that has played out, too, you know, in some circumstances. But other times, I feel it, it becomes, at first, for some folks, it's the first time hearing it, it becomes something they don't want to hear. Like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. Because there's almost this fear of the loss of the South. So wait a minute. So are you saying that I'm not really Mexican? If what I believe has been always been Mexican, isn't really Mexican. And, and then of course there's, there's the, the, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, folks that are really doing their best to help me see how important colonization is with exposing us to salt and sugar and these other detrimental ingredients that impact our health and livelihoods, you know, but I stand my ground because I am aware of what these processes are and also to the histories of sugar and the histories of, of salt yeah, and how yeah. those, those played out in European cuisine, mm-hmm. you know, and that's something that I, that I, I, I share to everybody. If folks want to begin to really understand their indigeneity through food, Yes, learn about your indigenous foodways. Of course, you know, for me, it was, it was you know, understanding Mesoamerican foodways and what those foods look like, you know, in season and in different regions. But it was really important for me to understand European foodways because those European foodways were brought over through conquest and colonization. Mm-hmm. And those were situated within particular, you know, philosophical ideologies of the body mm-hmm. and the land. Right. And so, you know, once I understood that, then I was able to really piece together this puzzle and understanding, you know, the, these different dimensions that, that are important to rupture, you know, when it comes to, you know, understanding the colonial encounter. And again, a matter of surviving. So, you know, it hasn't always been pleasant in, in circles, but I feel for those folks that do search and, and want this knowledge and, and, and not just through through talking about it, but the practice of it, when we come to meet each other, whether it's through, you know, cooking or eating together or creating recipes together, then it becomes something that is desired, something that is craved, something that one wants to taste in however ways one is capable of tasting, right? Because there's multiple ways that one can taste because it involves all the senses, right? And then it becomes, you know, a, a, a moment of decoloniality in practice. And that is what keeps me going. That's what keeps me, you know, pushing this work even further every, every day, every time, every new conversation, you know, because now it's just, it's just a life work at this point. You, you can't go back. You can't, you know, you, know, you just can't. At, and, and at this point, you know, all I can do is cook food, prepare it and have people taste it. 
and we can have a conversation around a kitchen table. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Right, particularly considering, uh, again, the health ramifications for so many of our family members, for ourselves, for our communities, uh, when you realize how good you can feel when you're actually nourishing yourself and when we're nourishing each other as opposed to just exactly. right, buying merchandise that's been advertised as food and poisoning ourselves, how do you go back? Oh, <laughs> how can you go back? You, yeah, when, when you're so used to eating some a particular food that makes you feel alive, no, yeah, you just can't after after all these years, you know. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not always. People think, oh, do you always eat this decolonial way? No, you know, like mm-hmm. I go to different places, you know. Maybe I'll grab a slice of bread here, but I don't eat bread every day like I used to. Mm-hmm. I just don't. When I cook, I do cook with beans. I do cook with staple foods, right? Like it's it's been a lot a, a long journey. Like I didn't just arrive here overnight either. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that's also a misconception. It's like, oh, well, it's just something you could just say you're going to do and do. No, I've been doing this work since I was 20. Like, I'm 41 now, you know? Like, <laughs> it, yeah, it feels like it just happened overnight, but it hasn't. It's taken a lot of research, a lot of dedication, a lot of hours standing on my feet, working in multiple, multiple kitchens, and not just not just learning about how to prepare food, but also building relationship with this food, you know? Mm-hmm touching it, smelling it, you know, hearing it, knowing its story, where it came from. And then also to the recipes that it comes with. Right. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How, you know, it, it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot of work. But at the end, it's all worth it. This is this, you know, it's all worth it. Right. I really appreciate your sharing that because so often folks can feel pressure, you know, for instant gratification or for some overnight or weekend miracle or transformation. And so it's so important if you ask me for us to be realistic, especially when we're shifting habits and patterns that have been passed down intergenerationally, like you've been speaking to, to be patient with ourselves, to really give ourselves the space to be able to do the thing instead of, right, burning out or being impatient and then being disappointed potentially. So thank you for sharing in terms of your own experience that it has taken time. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for holding space like this to have this conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just so very important for the health of our planet and our families moving (laughs) forward for folks to be taking all this more seriously, right? Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I have to ask, is there an ingredient or a recipe these days that you've really been enjoying getting to know better? You know, the first thing that comes to mind, this is really funny you asked that, uh-huh. um, ha- has been two ingredients. Okay. And it, well, actually, okay, well, two main ingredients and mm-hmm. one one that is just there on the sidelines. But I've been having a lot of fun lately with um, avocado, cacao, and agave that's really all you need. So I've been making this this rock avocado cacao pudding. And I add a little bit of agave to it. And um, I, it just, it makes me happy. It, it and, and, you know, just eating it alone. But what I've also begun to do is, is ask myself, well, what else can I put this combination in? And usually around, you know, the new year going into uh, spring, I start to integrate more smoothies and more liquids into my body so that I can begin to, you know, detox um, and, you know, prepare my body for spring. So I've been playing with my smoothies also where I'm now taking, you know, one day it'll be an avocado, you know, chocolate mousse, right, cacao mousse. And the next day it's going to be I'm going to put it inside a smoothie. And uh, so that's been a lot of fun for me. And um, I'm also, you know, playing more with it and thinking and rethinking desserts. Again, you know, this is a sugar high craving culture. It's what we've been exposed to, especially me as a child. I ate a bunch of ding dongs and Twinkies and, you know, because we didn't know any better. And somehow this this just this little dab of, of ancestral sweetness is is what has been making me so happy these days. And so now I've also used it as a whip when I put together some of my other raw dishes that I make for my daughter and myself. You know, so it's, it's really based, two basic staple ingredients that are, you know, ancient food ways that have been preserved and passed down and continue to cultivate and grow and, and play a huge role in our cultural food ways, the avocado and the cacao. Like, 
just those two ingredients alone have been pretty popular in my palate these days. Uh-huh. Yeah, why wouldn't they be so delicious? My goodness, right? Uh, yeah. And it also brings up or evokes to me just the beauty of, in a context that can be more horizontal, sharing. So just hearing you speak to that, and in my life, even the years that I have lived in what would be called present-day California, I mean, immediately the somatic response hearing you speak to avocado and cacao, I would just like to thank from the bottom of my being all of the ancestors that have nourished, right? Thousands of varieties of those plants for people to be able to share in. It's so significant to be able to name and recognize that, right? So on behalf of all of the ancestors that had anything to do with the preservation of those plants, I am so sincerely appreciative. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, we've talked about so much. Do you want to follow up on any of the topics that we've gotten into so far in case there was something perhaps that we might have left out that you'd like to return to? Yeah, you know, the, the only thing that's really sitting with me now is, again, it you know is understanding how colon how the colonization of food occurred. Uh, I feel that there isn't a lot of discussion around that, and I guess this is more for the listeners, right? I really encourage folks to really take the time to do that research. Um, you know, it, it's really easy to jump on the bandwagon that you know the decolonizing de- de- this and decolonizing that. Um, you know, but it, I, I encourage folks. Uh, to really, you know, take the time to, you know, explore what happened, you know, within, you know, the, you know, the colonial contact, the colonial encounter, um, and, and focus in on food. Uh, there is a lot to learn. Um, and, you know, it, it's knowledge that one needs to be responsible for, um, because it's one thing to go out and say, oh, I'm going to facilitate a, a conversation or space around decolonizing the diet. But if we are not, you know, historicizing it, then we're, we're losing something. We're losing something very significant um, that speaks to something that is already, you know, embodied within within us and our culture and our taste palette. So, you know, we want to really address the root of, of, of all evil. I, I, I really suggest you know, returning to that, to those moments and those ideologies that uh, were introduced with colonialism, um, because I feel that it'll help uh, widen the perspective and also to widen the conversations that are occurring, um, because it's just so relevant. And it was something that really, really informed me and helped me be confident with my word and the knowledge that I carry and, and share with folks, um, because, you know, I don't take that very lightly. It, it's something that you know, again, comes with responsibility. You know, if you're going to be a, a, um, a carrier of knowledge or a palabra carrier, like, you know, we, we got to honor that and, and represent it and, and you know, in, in a good way um, that'll um, allow folks to, to question and learn and grow from. Mm-hmm. Uh, so very important. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, and if folks want to be in touch with you or to learn more about the work that you do, how can they um, become more familiarized with your work? Yeah. So uh, right now I, I do have, um, I'm kind of staying a little low pro on social media. Um, I am very active on Instagram. So um, I am, I do have my own personal Instagram page. Mm-hmm. Uh, so folks can follow me there um, mm-hmm. at uh, woman76. Um, I also have uh, Cocina Manacurini. Right now they do have um, a Facebook and an Instagram as well. Um, and my personal webpage should be available, I want to say, within the next couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still under construction, and that's because, too, I'm also in the middle of uh, finishing up, wrapping up my dissertation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, and also, too, um, they can email me directly okay. um, at at woman um, at gmail uh, dot com, okay. and that's W O M B Y N. Mm-hmm. Great. All right. Well, we will link to all of those resources. Uh, and in the meantime, thank you so much for the work that you do and for everything that you shared and your time and energy today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Anjali, for having me and for um, creating digital space to have these types of conversation. Perhaps the show has you wondering about the foodways native to the land you're currently on or your ancestors' taste buds. I invite you to try a recipe from your lineage or the land base you're on and continue this dialogue over some nourishment. Freedom is on.
That's it for today's episode of Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I've been your host, Anjali Nathupadhyay, and I thank you for listening. I'm also curious to know what this dialogue evoked for you. I invite you to post your reflections and questions in the comments section below to continue our collective journey of unlearning, remembering, and imagining. If you want to share feedback, such as segment ideas or potential guests you'd like to hear on the show, email liberationspring at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow Feral Visions on SoundCloud or iTunes, where you can find our show archive. If you'd like more information on this show's topic or to donate to the project, check out liberationspring.com. Thanks to Catherine Petru and Nicole Gervasio of our technical production team and Climbing Poetry for our theme song. Be sure to tune in for next week's episode. And in the meantime, let's make our ancestors proud. The power of the people is louder than the evil. Deceitful and coward, people in power. All power to the people is the hour of the peaceful. Freedom is ours, yeah. Freedom is ours.